Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. You know, I believe in that African call and response pattern. So, you know, I have to make sure that my people are out there. So today, I'd like to thank James and Bob for the wonderful introductions and for the opportunity to stand before you tonight as a former Fulbright scholar. I was trying to decide how I was going to open. I thought about singing. I said I thought about singing. But I said, you know you can't carry a tune, so don't do that. So instead, I'm going to honor the ancestors that are living with a poem written by a South African named Lebo Mashile, which is called Tell Your Story. And she says, active day fed off your memories, erased dreams from your eyes, broken the seams of sanity, and glue was left together with lies. After the choices and voices have left you alone, and silence grows solid, adhering like flesh to your bones. They've always known your spirit's home, lay in your gentle sway, to light and substance, but jaded mirrors and false prophets have a way of removing you from yourself, you who lives with seven names, you who walks with seven faces, none can eliminate your pain. Tell your story, let it nourish you, sustain you, and claim you. Tell your story, let it feed you, heal you, and release you. Tell your story, let it twist and remix your shattered heart. Tell your story until your past stop tearing your present apart. So my story today, you know, it, 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 it's been going on for some time. I've been to South Africa multiple occasions. But I think this Fulbright year, I was the most present. And when I said it, I'm savoring every moment of it. So on March 30th, excuse me, March 23rd, 2017, I was in Cape Town, South Africa, conducting research. And something told me at 3.30 p.m. their time to check my email. And so I received this email which stated, on behalf of the J. William Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, I am pleased to congratulate you on your selection for a Fulbright Award to South Africa. I stepped back from the laptop. I'm like, is this for real? Because I was told that we were here about the results in April. So I went back and laid on the couch. I was like, that must be that must not be for real. So I wrote a couple of friends and I said, if they respond back with congratulations, this email must be real. And so it was. And that day changed my life. And I had wanted to call everybody, my mama, my professors, even Jacob Zuma, you know, the former president of South Africa. But then I wondered why would I call him? So as a scholar who has been researching the role of women in political systems in South Africa for more than 15 years, I was excited to return to my beloved home to carry out the mandates of a Fulbright scholar. And in 1946, then Senator J. William Fulbright of Arkansas introduced the Fulbright program, awarding approximately 8,000 grants annually. And this is a program that is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. I stand before you as a Fulbright Scholar because of my industry first and foremost, but also because of the constructive criticism and support that I received from colleagues like Amelia Montez, Parks Colville, Amy Burnett, Laura Munoz, and Laura Damoth, who read drafts of my proposal. And I would also like to thank my chair, Dr. James Lasura for his enthusiastic support. And I would also like to thank my friend Natasha Crawford, who also made it possible for me to conduct my research in South Africa. So, 
As an ambassador for the United States Department of State and the University of Nebraska, I carried out cultural exchange and research endeavor for one year. I was based in Johannesburg, and if anybody knows me, knows that is my home in South Africa. And so I will call it like I call it all the time, Joburg. So I was in Joburg. I conducted research at, at multiple archival institutions, such as the William Cullen Library at the University of the Witwatersrand, the National Archives of South Africa in Pretoria, the Campbell Collections in Durban, South Africa, the Western Cape Repositories in Cape Town, as well as the Mayibui Center at the University of the Western Cape. And so, my intellectual inquiry, that's me trying to be all astute in the, the archives, dealt with several women for instance, Cecilia Lulin Shabalala, Mina Tembega Soga, Charlotte Maya Matike, Bertha Mkize, Nokotulu Dube, the Alexandra Women's League, among other female subjects to, to explore how they proper resolutions for a better South African society. In the interest of time, I will focus on one woman, Lulin Shabalala, and weave in other subjects into the conversation. I was first introduced to Shabalala in a graduate class at Ohio University. And the professor there was talking about the bus board class of Alexandra, and he talked about this woman. And I wanted to know more about this woman because much wasn't written about women in the Alexandra bus boycott, say like we have for the Montgomery bus boycott, where you know the names of multiple women who contributed to that historic feat. Now, Shabalala was born in 1888 to parents Daniel and Chandelier Shabalala of royal descent, as her clan name in Shango attested. She grew up near Lady Smith, where she would attend the former Oshlang Institute, modeled on African-American educator Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee University. Inspired by the motto Learning and Labor, Oshlang sus subscribed to the stern social Darwinist principle of survival of the fittest in hopes that its pupils would be an educated, self-sufficient, Cold War elite or African Christian bourgeoisie. As a Klang graduate, Shabalala always invoked the cultural ethos that had defined the institution and watched this core message of upliftment. I'm going to talk about four, three examples using Shabalala who after she was in the United States from 1912 to 1930. And during that time, and when she went back to South Africa, she started two women's organizations. One was the Daughters of Africa, which was modeled on the African American club called the National Association of Colored Women, and she also in, which she founded in 1932. And she also founded the Women's Brigade, which maintains solidarity in good order in Alexandra, which is a township nine miles northeast of Johannesburg. And I'm going to use her to, to cite three examples of how African women contributed to political thought, which is the core of my next intellectual offering. So drawing from Shabalala's editorials that appeared in the widely read African newspaper Bantu World in the 1930s, she explored as one of her intellectual questions, nationhood. Because she defined nation, Shabalala swam in highly charted male-dominated waters. Her male contemporaries who represented the Natal Native Congress and the African National Congress formed respectively in 1901 and 1912, differed from her. In particular, the Natal Native Congress humanized the nation by calling it the eyes, the ears, the mouth, and the voice of the African people. Not seeing the nation as a watchdog, Shabalala viewed the, the nation as an instrument to address societal ills, to foster greater unity, to define women's woes, and to mentor the youth. Different from the ANC and the NNC, who rallied heavily around race to bring Africans together, Shabalala, in much the same fashion as African-American educator Booker T. Washington, championed self-help and industry. 
And she did this through her Daughters of Africa, which served as a model, as a blueprint for how to construct, construct civic engagement and a Christian democracy. In another example that further illustrates Shabalala's connectivity with male leaders, in 1857, linguist, composer, and reverend Tia Sogo pled for Africans to fulfill, realize their promise, as the song's title translates. Word about the loss of African identity and mid-European encroachment and domination, Soga implored Africans to fulfill, realize their promise. In the quest to seek a higher power, Soga called on a faithful, truthful God to save all races, all nations. And Shabalala would echo this message in, a, in her song entitled, Those Who Build Their House. This hymnal served as a how-to manual that authorized women to pray, to stand, to donate, to set a good example, to hold hands, and to work with God. Those who build their house, like Soga's composition, call for God to hear them when they pray for the nation, the whole black nation. Now she would go on to participate in similar dialogues with women. And my point of all of this is to show that African women were in conversation with each other as well as men. And that is what I was able to piece more together as a Fulbright scholar. So she had a conversation with Nogatula Dube, who was a dressmaker, musician, and teacher. And she was the wife of the ANC's first president, John L. Dube. And Dube would use music to uplift, to teach, and construct an African nation. And these women were not alone. West Africans. Adelaide Casely Hayford Smith joined her contemporaries in employing music when she composed the school song, So That All the World May Know Girls. Shabalala used litany, songs, and editorials to create a blueprint for a better South African society. From 1912 to 1919, she trained as a missionary at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Illinois and the New Britain Normal School in Hartford, Connecticut. As a student in two of the best missionary schools in the world, Shabalala gained valuable knowledge that she later applied as a principal at a girls' training school in present-day Ghana, formerly known as the Gold Coast, during her three-year tenure there from 1919 to 1922. Because Ghana provided another geographical landscape to piece together Shabalala's narrative with other women on the African continent, I stepped foot in this country for the very first time in April 2018. And I was able to do this because Fulbright offered a separate program called the Africa Regional Travel Program, which I had to submit a proposal, a budget, and get a letter of invitation from the host institution that I was seeking to establish collegial relations with. So the purpose of the RTP was to allow awardees the opportunity to disseminate knowledge in one or multiple countries through workshops, presentations, lectures, performances, exhibits, and other exchanges. So my main goal was to build relations with this organization and to continue the work that I had already done as a research associate at the University of Pretoria, where I pre presented several seminars and where I will also be presenting this coming July as a co-organizer of a colloquium with my colleague Tula Simpson there. So, being in Ghana provided me the opportunity to piece together more about Shabalala. I wanted to know more about this woman who oftentimes appeared in the newspapers in dresses draped by pearls. But when the former senator of Johannesburg described her in his memoir as a fierce woman, 
you know, who could at any moment burst into a loud command or laughter when she paraded throughout the township of Alexandria to stop people from boarding the buses. And I kept wondering, by going to Ghana, would the real Shabalala stand up like those contestants had done numerous times on the hit television game show, Truth or Consequences? Y'all know? Y'all remember that? So, in addition to solving this riddle, I, I wanted to further my own education as a scholar, as a professor, and as a person by touring various historical sites within and outside the capital. I presented my work on Shabalala as a participant in a seminar series at the University of Ghana and its Institute of African Studies. My research was well received. It was in an audience that had no idea that they had a connection like this to a South African. So that sparked up many conversations post-talk. So after that talk, they treated me to a meal. And of course, I downed that with a nice beverage, adult beverage, you know. And after also, I served as a guest on the university's radio station in a segment entitled Interrogated Africa, which I showcased Shabalala and made comparisons with other women on the continent, like Ghana's Yah Asaintawa, one of the nation's important historical figures. I will tell you more about these connections by relaying my trip to one of the slave castles that I visited. At Cape Coast Castle, I came even closer to Yah Asentawa, a military strategist who opposed British colonialism when I stood in the very room where the British had held her captive. Originally built by the Portuguese, Cape Coast changed several European hands before it landed with the British in 1664. The British had placed 200 shackled women in a dungeon, this very dark and poorly ventilated chamber where they ate, bathed, and excremented human waste. On the floor was a urinal carved in a rectangular shape that defined a large part of the cement floor. Feces were piled high up against the wall near the door. The line of their height still etched the wall. And if this didn't place us in their shoes. The guy closed the door and immediately darkness enveloped. I almost hyperventilated and yeah, it was a very hard thing to do, but it it allowed me to be able to teach this by having walked through those same paths that former African captives were held. So when we were in that dark room and there was no illumination, no ventilation, I thought about a similar experience that UNL students and I shared at the slave castle in Cape Town when I taught my History of South Africa course there in 2014, 2016, and 2017, something had possessed me. Tears rolled down my face. Later, I thought about this and how uncomfortable I felt and wondered why I subjected myself to this. But as the late Anthony Bourdain once said, travel isn't always pretty. It isn't always comfortable. Sometimes it hurts. It even breaks your heart, but that's okay. The journey changes you. It should change you. It leaves marks on your memory, on your consciousness, on your heart, and on your body. He was so right. The Cape Coast Slave Castle brought all of my inner grief to the surface. It reminded me of the many occasions during this Fulbright year that I conducted interviews with South Africans who shared narratives about the atrocities that they endured under apartheid, how they grieved when the South African regime prohibited or regulated funerary practices, and how they found other ways to mourn, like to reclaim the bodies, visit the sites of death, and create all obituaries. My thoughts were transported to South Africa even further when I witnessed an altar adorned by wreaths that were lined up against the walls in another part of the dungeon. 
I made this connection because narrators that I interviewed often spoke about visiting the sites of death and using blood stains, brains scattered on the ground, and other markers on the landscape that had commemorated the deceased in a grisly way. I thought, wow. This is how the spirits and African descendants can mourn and eulogize the pain of the past and the present. African female captives were also part of this conversation. The statues of their heads voiced their despair, agony, sorrow, uncertainty, and their communal and individual loss in much the same way that I and other visitors shared. We walked throughout that dungeon, through the tunnel, bending down in one part before we crossed the door of no return. And that is the door where Africans were the last time that they were on African soil and they went through that door to get to those ships that were carrying them across seas along to the, um, on the middle passage to places they, ne they never heard of before. While many of the names of these women who passed through this portal remain unknown, Yah Asintawa is immortalized. She has also seared her name in the world's consciousness by issuing this militant declaration before she led the Ashanti people against the British in the War of the Golden Stool, which is a revered symbol of Ghanaian authority. She said this, now, I have seen that some of you fear to go forward to fight for our king. If it were the brave days of O.C. Tutu, Okamofo, Onokye, and Opu, Opukuware the first, chiefs would not sit down to see their king taken without firing a shot. No white man could have dared to speak to the chief of Asante in the way the governor spoke to you chiefs this morning. Is it true that the bravery of Asante is no more? I cannot believe it. I, it cannot be. I must say this. If you, the men of Asante, will not go forward, then we will. I shall call upon my fellow women. We will fight the white men. We will fight till the last of us falls on the battlefield. Years later, in another way that I'm making connections with the African women and having them in conversation with each other and just opposing them alongside men, I've taken other quotes that are similar to make this connection. So years later in 1940, Nigeria's Funumalayo Ransom Kuti, the first woman to drive a car in that country in 1907, founder of several women's organizations, one of them being the Abakuda Women's Union, which later became the Nigeria Women's Union. And she was also a traveler during this to the Soviet Union, China, and Hungary during the Cold War. And she echoed Ya Asentawa's sentiment when she said, in a move to empower women, she remarked, for a long time, you have used your penis as a mark of authority that you are our husband. Today, we shall reverse the order and use our vagina to play the role of husband. Shabalala also sought to empower women and call them to arms and her many pronouncements in the editorials that she wrote, the meetings and conferences that she held, and in a statement that acknowledged the ills that plagued pre-apartheid South Africa, which is known as the segregation era. She talked about the constraints of mobility brought on by the past laws, those identity documents that African men first had to carry on their persons at all times or else face arrest or fines. She also talked about the geographical sequestration of Africans into townships and how the segregation was marked on the landscape, the extraction of cheap and pliant labor, the rise of urban vices, gangsterism, prostitution, alcoholism, and increasing economic and political infringements led Shabalala to conclude that the South African struggle was a human rights issue that only God could resolve through the voice of women. And again, these women are talking to each other and talking about the power, the innate power of African women. And I'm going to make one more connection before I close. And this pertains to local history. 
One of the women that I have been researching was actually in Lincoln. In 1939, Mina Tabega Soga, who was the leader of the National Council of African Women, cared forth the missionary spirit when she called on Africans to embrace, embrace Christianity. So in many ways, these pronouncements by African women would, were said to unify to bring together women and men occupying different and similar places on the African continent, how they channeled each other in the analysis of resistance and became each other's spirit mediums. As spirit mediums who carried the spirit of Yah as Saint Tawa, they provide a framework for understanding how African women contributed to intellectual thought, how they interpreted the conditions of their respective societies, and how they spoke to each other as actors on a continental stage. Later, again, I spent a lot of time in South Africa reflecting. I occupied this chair where I stayed, and in fact, people saw that as my chair and even told people to get up. You know, that's Dawn's chair. So in that chair, I was able to contemplate, sip on my tea and think about all of this as a Fulbright scholar and think about that slave castle whose heat and hollowness has suffocated me. My story was being told through these women as a scholar, as a traveler, as an educator, and as a person in search of knowledge. Thus, like my Sheely's poem suggests, I will continue to share their narratives until my past and theirs stops tearing my present apart. And that's what is how the Fulbright has impacted me in my research. Thank you.